I wanted the format for this discussion to be kind of informal. There's a lot of people here with a fair amount of expertise on different topics, but some people just have questions they'd like to ask. Uh, uh, the, the subject of marching rights is something that uh, comes up from time to time, and often there's a lot of confusion about how it works, when it applies, when it doesn't apply, or, you know, uh, and, and so what, one idea is to sort of walk through and, and deepen the understanding about how marching rights work. And then also to talk about in the limited areas where it does apply, what are some of the challenges in making marching requests work? Because it's not like a silver bullet. Uh, and, and there's a lot of things that have to kind of line up for things to work, and a lot of obstacles. We're gonna uh, walk through uh, some of the previous marching requests so people have an idea historically uh, what, what, what cases, at least the ones we know about uh, and how they've played out. I don't want to spend too much time on that. And then, uh, and, and then we're going to talk, I think, more forward-looking about uh, cases that people think could be brought and walk through some of the, the issues that have to be talked about in, in, in formulating a case, everything from the grounds to overcoming the challenges of non vital patents or to... Uh, to um, uh, uh, other barriers like finding suppliers, and we'll go through those things. I have a couple of slides just from the very beginning, and I'll try and uh, uh, show, go through those pretty quick, and then I think the rest of it's going to be uh, just an informal back and forth. And uh, I'll be moderating this, but I'll be uh, uh, sort of encouraging people to reach out to some people, but also. Uh, it'd be fine if people want to indicate that they, they want to ask a question or make a contribution, they should be relaxed about doing that. I'm going to go ahead right now. I'm going to share my screen. I'm going to start with uh, a couple of introductory slides just to sort of uh, get us a little bit grounded um, on what the Vital Act for people that are, that are less, less familiar with it. Let's see if this works for everyone. Um, this, do people see this? Um, Yes. This is good. Okay, so I'm going to um, talk about marching rights. It's very simple. I want to uh, start out with the idea that this is a, the initial discussion is really about the Bayh-Dole Act, although later on we'll talk about the fact that there are now cases where the Bayh-Dole Act won't be the controlling law on how a marching case, case involved, but the Bayh-Dole Act is sort of the the main one that most people think would be relevant. There is a, uh, uh, the Bayh-Dole Act was passed initially in, in 1980, and it's it been modified several times since. Um, the policy objective of the act is here. I kind of broke it up and where I've taken the parts that, that, that we focus on more uh, toward the end in these four bullet points and say among the objectives and policy of the act is to make sure the federal government has sufficient rights in federally supported inventions in order to meet the needs of the government, but also to protect the public against non-use or unreasonable use. And this is really important because a lot of the people that are critics of marching rights have alleged that the act is being satisfied as long as their product comes to the market. And so they say, well, if, if, if a drug is in the market, if you can buy it, even if it costs like $2 million or whatever the, the number is, as long as it's available, people have satisfied the conditions of the act. But the act right in the beginning says that it's not just non-use of inventions, it's unreasonable use of inventions, which is also part of the act. The, uh, get this down here, the grounds. Uh, there are four main, main grounds that are given in, in uh, the Marching Statute, which is 35 U.S.C. 203. In, in subparagraph A, this gives the four grounds. Uh, the first one is to achieve practical application. When most people would read this, they might think, well, does that mean you just have to have a, as a product you can buy or use? No, it's actually defined, and that's the next slide, what that actually means. The second one is to uh, alleviate health and safety needs, which are not reasonably satisfied by the contractors. So it's not just health and safety needs, but you have to show that the person that owns, owns the, uh, the patent is not recently sa uh, satisfying them, themselves. The third one is the actions necessary to meet requirements for public use. 
And then the last one has to do with the US manufacturing requirement. The definition of practical application has been a very contentious thing. Uh, 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 Michael Davis and, uh, and uh, Peter and I wrote an article in a law review article some years ago where they highlighted that there was this uh, in the definition that you, you required to achieve practical application. One of the requirements is you have to make it, the benefits of inventions available to the public on reasonable terms. In practice, the NIH, for example, has just interpreted this as available to the public and they leave out these last three words on reasonable terms. And so this available to the public on reasonable terms was uh, something that was trying to that NIST oppose, uh, proposed a regulation on to say that this did not include the price of a product. And in this, in this NIST proceeding, there was over 80,000 comments that were submitted, which was pretty amazing because like a, a previous rulemaking, maybe had like 13 comments. So this was an outpouring of opposition to this request. And then the executive order uh, on competition by the president and and this report on pricing by the secretary of HHS, they both rejected the idea that you'd restrict margin uh, cases uh, on pricing terms. So pricing is, and this administration is on the table, uh, but there's certainly a lot of uh, opposition to this by uh, the, the people that are patent holders or drug companies. Another issue that comes up, and this was, uh, I think, uh, uh, discussed some in some of the, the, the recent reporting on this issue, for example, in the a long article in the Washington Post about the uh, whether, whether marching rights are real or not, they talked about the fact that uh, if you win a marching case at the administrative level, that the patent owner can appeal it and you can't get the remedy of the march in um, until the, the appeals are exhausted. And this was held out as one of the things that makes the act so it's really hard to implement. We'll talk about that later on. Um, there's a pretty expensive uh, uh, freewheeling discussion about what the legislative history of the act is. I'm not gonna go into it right now, but I, I will say that there was a lot of people that commented on this in the recent NIST thing. Uh, a number of academics and people on both sides uh, weighed in on this issue. We had a very significant and long uh, uh, walking through of, of the legislative history. I, I will just sort of say that there were several bills over a period of two Congresses that dealt with exactly the same issue, which was the, the uh, attempt to create a uniform patent policy. And there was lots of hearings by lots of committees. And so you can find all sorts of things said in different committees and you piece them through, you find no clear message about what the definition is of reasonable terms uh, uh, or how much it works, but you find plenty to support the notion that it's a quite uh, open, uh, uh, an open mandate that, that allows the government quite a bit of discretion as to how to act. By the way, recently, uh, we've seen some emails that the NIH really has made it clear that they think they can exercise a marching right on a patent by themselves, even if they're not petitioned by a third party to do so. But most of the cases so far, not necessarily all of them have come when, when somebody has petitioned the government to do it. And talk here about the, the, the past cases. And now I'll invite people that kind of weigh in if they know something about them. The first case, which has been written about really extensively for a long time, the only case people initially wrote about was the 1997 Cellpro case. And this was a, a case where Johns Hopkins had patents and Cellpro was a firm. And there was a dispute between them as to whether or not Cellpro infringed on a, a, the stem cell a technology they had on a medical device. Uh, Cellpro lost the case. The, 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 one of the things that came out of this case, it was one of the two to which, um, I shouldn't say two, it's, it's, it's one of the most highly publicized cases. There was no hearing on this case, but there was extensive lobbying, uh, media coverage back and forth and pleadings that were being filed. Um, Senator Dubai represented Cellpro trying to get the, the March and Right remedy. And one of the arguments he used was that if the, if, if the licensing practice resulted in high prices, that that was something the government should be concerned about under the Bayh-Dole Act, a position he, he flip-flopped on later when he had different clients. The, two, the 1999, um, oh, I would say on the, on the cell phone case, uh, the one thing the government did is they prevented Johns Hopkins from, uh, or Beckton Dixon or Baxter from, enforcing an injunction against Cellpro and they allowed Cellpro to operate and sell its medical device until the, uh, the, the Johns Hopkins device, which was a rival, could actually be FDA approved. 
The 1999 DOA case is not really one that most people are aware of before. Uh, the DOA used to fund a lot of gene, uh, uh, a lot of research on, 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 on genetics they, because they had a big footprint in supercomputers. So a lot of the human genome project was done with funding from DOE. And so a lot of patents on diagnostics and some of the early gene patents are held by DOE. In this particular case, Ventana Medical Systems was trying to uh, file a margin request at the University of California on patents for the FISH test which were used to tell us if a, if a woman has a HER2 positive breast cancer. This is quite important uh, test for, for breast cancers. Uh, we're, we're in the process right now, we have a, a, a lot of documents from this case, which we haven't published yet because we're sorting through them and interviewing people. But the short, the short answer is that there was a hearing. This was one of two cases over the entire course of the act that we found where a hearing was held and, and testimony was given. And uh, DOA took this position that they, uh, that they wanted to uh, uh, encourage the parties to settle their thing and negotiate a voluntary, you know, a voluntary license while they went through the fact finding. And then toward the very end, uh, uh, DOA did come in with a draft, a proposed finding, which was quite unfavorable to the marching candidate. But then that, that was contested by the parties on both sides and they wanted modifications. And then Abbott bought uh, 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 I mean, I, I shouldn't say, and then Abbott bought the company that Vantana was in a, a patent dispute with uh, that had licensed their patents from the University of California. And then the case was, appeared to be settled because then Vantana still, you know, continued to offer the, the, uh, the infringing uh, device. Uh, later on, Vantana was acquired by Roche. Anyway, that's, that's a case most people aren't are, are familiar with, but the, the ultimate outcome was, was that, well, at some point, Ventana did get a license to use the, the inventions. In the Wharf case in 2001 was on stem cells. Uh, the, the narrative on that is that the, uh, Tommy Thompson, who was from Wisconsin, former governor, threatened um, uh, Wharf, which was the, uh, uh, the, the, the foundation in, in the University of, of Wisconsin that holds uh, patents for them and threatened to use Marchin or other government rights if they didn't liberalize the licensing of the stem cell patents, which they had a very sort of monopolistic footprint on at the time. And this was in the, the context of President Bush not allowing new, new uh, research uh, to, to create new stem cell lines, but he did allow the older stem cells lines to be used for therapeutic uses. And you had people like Christopher Reeves engaged in this who was hoping that use stem cells for his, his, his medical problems. And this was this, this came up in this context. Artie Ryan and other people, I think, have written about this one. In 2002, there was another DOE case involving Berkeley Heart Labs, and this was uh, this for a cardiovascular uh, treatment. And we don't know, I, I, the record's a little scarce in this, and it looks like it was an unsuccessful case, but I'm not really sure. In 2004, the second hearing that was held uh, on a marching in case, and the first and only hearing that's ever been held by the NIH was in the Norvair Ritonovir case. There were hundreds of newspaper stories written about this at the time. Uh, there were a lot of AIDS groups involved. This is when um, 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 Abbott had had, had a 400% had a, uh, increase in one day on the price of uh, ritonavir, which is a drug that's used to boost other AIDS drugs. And it was a critical component for all, uh, at the time, um, um, uh, all protease inhibitor treatments. One thing that people should know in this case, even though the marching didn't succeed, um, it, after the case was filed, and certainly long after it was, uh, people knew it was coming, um, Abbott rolled back the 400% price increase for all people on federal programs that were HIV positive. And that was about 70% of people on HIV programs at the time. And that was cited in the decision not to grant the marching request. So even though technically it was a failure, there was a positive outcome in the sense that the price hike for 70% of the patients and everyone on a federal program was rolled back after the case was filed. By uh, uh, a period of this case, and, if, and, and, and in this particular case, uh, by he reversed the position he'd taken earlier on the pricing and claimed that, you know, he made this big statement of like, oh, we never intended this, this act to have anything to do with reasonable prices and things. And he did not disclose at the hearing that his, the firm that he was working for at the time and in which he was a partner, that 
that uh, I believe he was a partner, but he was working for this firm that represented Abbott in other litigation. Uh, the person representing Abbott at this hearing, by the way, um, later on to became uh, the CEO of uh, Vertex. Uh, the Zalatan case in, uh, in 2004 was filed around the same time as the uh, Norbert case, but it never got much attention. It was a, it, it was a, 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 a treatment uh, for, for eye disease uh, where Columbia University was involved, but it was rejected. In 2006, there was, a, uh, according to people that work for the uh, CDC, the CDC had threatened to use government rights under the Bayh-Dole Act against people that held patents on reverse genetic patents that were needed to manufacture avian flu vaccine for the CDC. And pursuant to those uh, threats, which were apparently not well documented, except through kind of oral interviews with people, um, uh, those patents were uh, made more, more widely available and they were necessary for uh, manufacturing a, a, a flu vaccine. In 2010, in the Fibrozyme case, which is a, uh, an enzyme it's used for, for people with fibrase disease, well, I don't have time to explain all these cases. I'm sorry about taking so much time, but in the, in the uh, in the, uh, in, in the Farber design case, uh, there was a manufacturing screw up in Boston where Genzyme Inc. was making this, this very expensive treatment. And uh, there was a global market for, for, for Farberzyme, primarily markets for Europe and the United States. And because of the manufacturing shortage, the people went on like reduced ration, uh, uh, doses in the United States, which was created a lot of health problems for people that were patients of this particular treatment. In Europe, uh, uh, the, the, the regulators in Europe said they would not allow them to restrict access uh, to the patients. So they, they, had, they, they would not allow them to get anything less than the full dose. And there was a competitor in Europe um, uh, that Shire was operating. And this had to do with the way the Orphan Drug Act played out in both the United States and Europe and the way patent lawsuits uh, worked out in both countries. So Europe had two, two firms selling very similar treatments. The US had just one. Alan Black represented the patients, Joseph Carrick and uh, other, other members of his family. Mount Sinai Hospital was on the other side. And the NIH rejected the uh, petition. One of the reasons why the NIH rejected the petition is they thought that uh, uh, even if they cleared the patents, they didn't think that uh, that Carrick and uh, and his colleagues could find an alternative supplier in the United States that were relevant to the patents because of the challenges of overcoming the test ad exclusivity period. But that said, they still wouldn't grant uh, the thing. But one thing they did do is they forced Mount Sinai to not enforce an injunction in a patent in Germany that would have uh, made the uh, that would have taken the Shire product off the market in Germany and, and, and made the global shortage of Farbazine even worse. And so, a and, and, and a compulsory licensing case was also filed in Germany. So unbeknownst to the patients in the US, the NIH was, was micromanaging on a monthly reporting basis, this German litigation and compulsory licensing case in Germany, well, basically uh, uh, denying any relief to the people in the United States. But, this problem comes up, particularly in the biologics, even if you clear the patents, can you get a, a supplier uh, to give you that sort of remedy that you, you want to, to benefit the patients? In 2012, the Ritonover case was filed again. In this case, it was a new president. So the first one was done under Bush. The second one was done under, uh, was done under Obama. And the feeling was, well, maybe Obama will be better than Bush was, but no. Uh, and this particular case was filed by uh, uh, the American Medical Students Association, KI Perg, and, uh, uh, and, and, UA, and UAM. Um, and uh, in 2016, uh, there was another case uh, 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 that was filed for uh, Extandia, a uh, prostate cancer drug. And this, this case is sort of dragged on. It's still a live case. And that, this is a case where the price in the United States is about $150,000 a year. The price outside the United States is somewhere between twenty dollars and $40,000 a year in most countries, um, high income countries. So there's like U US people are paying like three to five times as much as anywhere else on the planet. 
um, it's, it's licensed to a Japanese company, uh, Estellas, uh, Pfizer is kind of a junior partner, and uh, University of California is the patent holder. Uh, that was rejected in 2006. There was another case filed uh, for a, a biologic drug for, for MS in, in, uh, in 2017, but that was resolved when the product was taken off the market by Biogen. In 2017, uh, the Department of uh, the, the uh, Senate Armed Service Committee passed a directive which required the Department of Defense to grant marching request if the price in the United States was higher than the median price for seven reference countries that were high income here that had large, um, large incomes, uh, large GDPs like France, Germany, UK, Canada. And uh, uh, because the Extandi case was funded by both DOD and congressionally uh, approved funding for prostate cancer and the NIH, the, the thought was that the DOD would then act on the petition because of the directive from the Senate Armed Services Committee, which was put in by Senator King. Um, but that was rejected uh, uh, by, the, uh, by, by the Trump administration. And, uh, well, that actually that wasn't rejected. Actually, that that uh, no. Well, that was just a, a directive. The case. Pardon me for for being confusing on this. The case. Uh, the first case was filed in two thousand nineteen. Uh, Claire Melvin Love is my brother. He's a prostate cancer patient, and he's a Vietnam veteran. And David Reed is a very famous computer scientist at MIT, also a prostate cancer patient. David Reed is the uh, is the person people credit the end-to-end -end con uh, concept for the internet. And they filed uh, their petition with the DOD in 2019. Uh, and they were referencing the Senate Armed Services Committee, which was chaired by Republicans at the time. And it was a unanimous recommendation out of the committee and they wanted them to implement it. They've heard absolutely nothing from the Department of Defense to this day on that petition. In 2020, um, uh, the state attorney generals filed a, 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 a petition headed by uh, the, uh, the attorney general of California, who's now the secretary of HHS, asking that the government exercise Martian rice and remdesivir, which is marketed by uh, a Gilead for COVID. And no action was taken on that as far as we can tell. And then in 2021, uh, Robert Sachs, who I think is on this call, uh, who's, a, who's a, on the board of directors of, uh, uh, of trustees of uh, the Dana-Farber Institute, among other things, uh, who's also a, a prostate cancer patient, he petitioned uh, the secretary under President Biden now, is now, now the president now, and he asked him to either join the petition or consider it a brand new petition. And we're still waiting to hear what happened on that. So those are the past cases. And I apologize for this 20 minute uh, discussion of, 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 of the past cases, but I think it's important to sort of know in the past, uh, what, what's kind of been out there. Do people have any questions about these uh, past cases? Uh, no? Okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, uh, I'm gonna switch that to, uh, 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 I'm going to go back here and talk about, I'm going to stop sharing the screen here so we can sort of see people again. Are we back on uh, no screen sharing again? I think we're normal right now. Yep, we're good. So uh, in, in the uh, concept note that was uh, it was initially put up as, as our webpage, I thought we would talk about going forward, um, what, what goes into a how, how you sort of establish a, a marching case. And, and the first thing I wanted to mention is that the, the first thing you have to do is you have to establish that, that there's a subject convention involved. Do people here, have they ever heard that term? Do people need to, I think they do need to explain what a subject convention is, right? The marching rights that the Bayh-Dole Act has, they're not triggered by, um, by, the fact that the government funded research and development. They're funded quite narrowly, uh, they're, they're triggered quite narrowly in whether the government funded the invention, a, a particular invention 
that may be relative to a product. So if the government funded, for example, the clinical trials or some other aspect of the development, for example, say of remdesivir or something like that, it doesn't necessarily mean that they have any right to march in because they have to show that they actually funded the specific invention. Now, there's some people here, I think, that have kind of worked on this issue a bit uh, and have, have uh, they may want to sort of also kind of weigh in and I don't want to like be, uh, be monopolizing the conversation here, but I know that Gerald Barnett's on the call. I know that we have someone from the NIH here. Um, I know that there's people from Public Citizen here, other people, um, uh, Susan Rucker, is, does anybody want to sort of explain to people a bit of what this concept of a subject convention is and why this is an important concept in the Bible Act? I, I think I can speak to that. I've been around this an awful long time working with Bidol and in practice at University IP. That a subject invention is, and in, this is comes from the Supreme Court case in uh, uh, Stanford v. Roche, that a subject invention is a invention that is or may be patentable that arises in work that's funded by the federal government under a funding agreement and is acquired by a contractor who is a party to that agreement. Okay, so the critical thing is, first of all, it's never a subject invention if it's not acquired by a contractor. It may be something else. There may be other reasons why the government has an interest, but they're not in by dole. Because this is the Supreme Court was really clear on this until it's acquired to an invention of the contractor, it can't be a subject invention. That's not how practice is. Practice is that universities call things subject inventions when they decide to, just in case, or out of abundance of caution, or because they don't care, and treat them as subject inventions. And federal agencies generally don't challenge those designations. The other thing that's really critical is that. Well, well, Jamie can say that it has to fund that invention. The statute actually doesn't say that. It may be part of practice that people review it though. It invent, the, the statute says, if it's made in work that receives federal funding in all or in part, this is the definition of funding agreement in 35 USC 201. If, it re, if it's made in a project that has at least received some federal funding and a contractor requires it, and it is or may be patentable, it's a subject invention. There may be no direct budget expenditures that are directed at something immediate to the invention. Well, and I'm yet it's still you know, a subject invention under the statute it's just that in practice, people try to split this. There was a case way back called Mine Safety Appliances uh, versus the United States in which U University of Southern California attempted to split its accounting so that it would do work for the Navy. And then on the side, it would do work that the Navy wanted, but they chose not to do. They did it on their own, got an invention, licensed it to mine safety equipment, and then Mine Safety Appliances sued the US government for um, royalties and lost. Gerald, that, Gerald that, that's to help us. subject there. invention. For, for people who don't know, Gerald, Gerald was a technology transfer at, at what, University of Washington or? Washington and the University of California system. And in, in the California system. Uh, Catherine uh, Arzon, you, you, can you give a comment a little bit about what the NIH, what the NIST post regulation is on separate accounting or was that, was that Luis that worked on that? I think you both worked on that issue, right? Louise or, or Catherine? Go ahead, Catherine. Louise is the person who prepared our comments on that, so he can probably best speak to it. But my recollection was that it would make it easier for companies to use this tendency, which um, Gerald Barnett recognized, to use separate accountings to try to say that something that was uh, developed under the work of a funding agreement isn't a subject invention, because they'll say government money wasn't directed at the part of the research that led to the subject invention, even if the uh, work is overwhelmingly funded by the government. But I'll let Luis speak to that. Luis, you wanna, you wanna add to that? Unmute. Luis, we can't hear you. 
Yeah, it looks like you're unmuted, but we cannot hear you. How about now? You're, you're good, yeah. you're good, you're good. Okay, different mics. Okay, so I don't have a lot to ask because that was a good explanation. Just to say that the actual sentence that NIST proposes to add is that an invention that is conceived or reduced to practice without the use of any federal funds is not considered a subject invention. We have already seen cases where uh, sentences like this would make it much harder for, for the public to even know whether they have rights in a particular invention. One recent case is the Regeneron uh, COVID-19 treatment where the company says that they did not use public money. We know that they did. Um, and we know that this particular treatment is subject to Bible rights, but it's so hard to, um, to prove that when they make that kind of claim um, that it just makes our, 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 our just even the, the transparency aspect of it, just even knowing that who has the right and whether the public can make a, a, a marching request, just that it becomes much harder when there's uh, this idea of, of, of separate accounting. So, so I think it's it's a pretty common situation that in in and the people that get research and development grants, they often have bigger budgets than just a grant for doing a variety of different things, and the, the research may be kind of complicated in terms of how things come about. So, right now, as Cheryl mentioned, if if the federal government provided any funding, even if there was a mixed funding case and there was and there was a mixture between public and private funding, for example, or the universities separate accounts versus uh, the, the NIH grant, whenever the government has a footprint in it, the government picks up the rights. That's the current lay of the land right now. What NIST is, uh, it wants to do and proposed under the Trump administration initially is to make it so that uh, the company can come in and say, well, uh, yeah, we did this on Thursday, but we were using you know, a different part of our budget on Thursday and you know, we used the NIH money on, on Wednesday. And, and so this, this is you know, the government rights don't apply to this thing. And it would be a very dramatic scaling back and when you can claim that uh, uh, Bidol uh, rights uh, apply to a patent. Um, are there questions about that before I move on to the next topic? Because I wanna, I've got about six things I wanna walk people through here. Uh, uh, well, the next, the next issue that uh, I want to talk about is, um, and I think this is really more fundamental to a marching request, is what counts uh, constitutes a grounds for marching request. Now, suppose, for example, that you think, well, I, I don't like the price of a product. It's just too high. Uh, I would like the government to march in and, and, um, and uh, issue uh, um, a compulsory license so that generic manufacturers can come in and drive the price down. You have to sort of come up with a, in a way, you know, I don't, you don't have to, but as a practical matter, you sort of have to come up with a theory as to when the government should act and when the government should not act. Um, you have to come up with a ground that not only would apply to your case, but the government may, in looking at this case, ask itself the question about whether or not they want to they wanna be stuck with that precedent that they set in this particular case for other cases. And uh, the NIH in, in the decisions they've had where they push back in the pricing clearly are worried about this, this issue about whether or not they put their, you know, if, if they get their foot wet in the, in, in, in the pricing issue and saying this price is good or this price is bad, do they end up having to look at every single case and is there any way they can sort of uh, explain consistently what an actual policy is? Now, uh, I, uh, I don't know if there's anyone from public citizen that has any thoughts on this or wants to speak to this or if Susan Rucker wants to say anything or if Paul Filner or anyone wants to sort of weigh in on this particular issue. But the grounds, having the grounds is, is really uh, a, a critical thing. In, in the Extandi case, which is before the Department of Defense right now, it's a very specific grounds. That is to say that the argument is if a US government funded invention is more expensive in the United States than it is in other high income countries, the government has to grant the margin request. So that background is American residents shouldn't pay more than foreigners do if the government funded the invention. That I think is a fairly enforceable and mechanical and a very, I think, modest sort of uh, precedent that you could be set. But what uh, a more challenging case would be, what happens if the price is just high everywhere? For example, what happens if you're challenging 
uh, the two the two million dollar cost of Zolgensa, which is a, a a gene therapy for spinal muscular atrophy, and the price is two million dollars everywhere, not not just in the United States. And, and what how would you articulate the grounds in those cases? Does, does anyone want to sort of comment on this issue among the great experts we have in this call? Amy, I know you're on the call now. Um, Robert Sachs, you're part of the extending petition. Maybe you'd like to say something. Well, I'm, you know, I'm a lay person on this, Jamie, and um, I don't profess to be an expert on marching. But you, it's just, uh, it's just uh, introduce yourself for the people really quickly. Yeah. Okay. Um, I said, I, I'm really a lay person on this and, and uh, don't hold myself out as an expert on on marching rights or what should constitute standing. And I think in the case of Xtandi, um, it's made easier by the fact of the um, Senate Armed Service Committee's directive to DOD in 2017 with a reference to foreign pricing and particularly the fact that this, this drug is sold for uh, several multiples higher uh, in the US than out, outside. Um, but I would defer to those of you who practice in this area as to the, the case that Jamie just presented, if the price is the same everywhere um, and it seems on its face to be exorbitant, uh, how do you get in the door? So I, I, I can't, uh, comment on that because I don't have the expertise. So Steve, uh, can you do you have any any thoughts on this issue? Uh, sorry, so um, you're asking, you know, how to how one would get at drugs for uh, for exercising marching rights that That's are exorbitantly priced everywhere, not just the United States? Yeah, or just what your thoughts are on what 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 sort of what sort of theories you, you, what kind of grounds you would see as being effective in a marching case? I mean, because I know that you all have looked at you are in the process of looking at cases, for example, right now in marching cases. Yeah, apologies for the somewhat vague answer. Like I, I think I mean for that question, like the if I'm not mistaken, the you know uh, available. Uh, you know, practical application is available on reasonable terms. Reasonable terms is not, does not necessarily mean, um, you know, if, if the price is, is, is extortionate everywhere, that would seem to me unreasonable, even if it's not like uniquely exorbitant in the United States. So, um, you know, I defer to some of our lawyers in the room. Uh, I, I, I see you have your hand up. Maybe you want to comment. No, I, but just from a policy point of view, like if, if you wanted the NIH, if you were to tell the NIH, um, we don't like exorbitant prices, and the NIH says to you, okay, how do I define an exorbitant price? Uh, what would you tell them? I mean, we, we followed your leadership a lot in this case. Um, you know, it, <laughs> I, I think that, the, you know, the international reference price, is, or, you know, looking at pr prices in other sort of countries that resemble the United States, from a you know overall uh, size of the economy and income per capita, that is like a good place to start, but is you know not comprehensive either. Well, if other other people have have suggestions on on the uh, on, on on just the pricing grounds, because there are other grounds. Like I know that in the Farbazine case, it was a supply shortage. Um, um, one, one one case you could look at is is there evidence that there are uh, that the price leads to uh, inadequate acquisition. Like I know that in the, in the case of uh, PrEP, for example, on the use of tenofovir and another drug to prevent the use of HIV infections, the high price was considered to be a barrier to having PrEP rolled out in the United States. It just, you know, just insurance companies didn't want to pay for it. It was just hard for people to pay for it themselves. So that would be like one ground is that the price is, is in practice actually results in, in a, a gap between the people that should be taking the drug and the people that do take the drug. I think that would be one, one way to frame a case. Another way to frame a case would be 
if you think overall, you think that the uh, returns are excessive. Like, like for example, if, uh, um, it, 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 if you look at the vaccines right now, like, you know, people are clocking in like $33 billion in one year or something on the Pfizer vaccine. That's not a buy to all marching case, but that's an example where, you know, uh, you, you could look at the, the amount of revenue that's generated under a product and see if that sort of exceeds the amount that you think was reasonable and necessary. Was that in a reasonable amount of money? It's hard to, it's hard to peg what's reasonable nowadays because the standards are just all out the window, right? I mean, there seems to be no, no cap, right, on what, what people are actually being, are earning on drugs. But you, it doesn't have to be that way. You could imagine that we've, re we've recommended that you, the government set standards and say after a certain amount of money that is generated over a, a product under a legal monopoly on a government-funded drug, you'd either stop, start reducing the price or shortening the period of the monopoly. Um, uh, because it, enough is enough. Like you, you, you know, it, it's just not like a, co a completely unlimited amount of money you can make on a monopoly on a government-funded drug. That that would that could be a policy that could be implemented. Uh, yeah, in 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 the mid 1960s, there were antitrust hearings over drug prices, and there was an edited book uh, by Irene Till that recounts this and recites it and at one point they were discussing what was a reasonable price and they gave the the reasonable pricing people gave the example of a, a elderly woman who was unable to afford the price of the necessary drug that she was prescribed it would take up half of her fixed income and so she was having to ration it or not have the drug at all and this was an argument that says this indicates an unreasonable price that people who need it can't afford it. And in reply, a CEO of a drug company said, no, you have it all wrong. It's a reasonable price because that's what we decided we could sell it for. That was our reasoning. And what you have is a failure of the government to adequately subsidize the income of elderly people on fixed incomes. And it is a government shortfall in your own willingness to support these people who are on fixed incomes, social security or other things, that is causing the problem. And this was the balance I think you can start to see in this, you know, 50, 60 years later, the same thing. The drug companies say, look, the, the idea of reasonable is that we thought it through. And the contrary position is reasonable is that the public generally can afford it within their means. Well, I, 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 those are the sort of these big polls and in between you can do whatever you want to, but they were seeing it as antitrust. It wasn't, it wasn't yet even a marching thing. It was simply, this is antitrust at that level of those two polls. And so within that, I think Baidol is asking you to get within those two poles. It's not an antitrust thing. It's still just a march in thing. And somewhere between whatever the drug company wants and people can't afford it, you have this middle ground. Now, the government has started to say, we are supplying this. So like in the cases of the COVID remedies, the vaccinations, the government is buying them and handing them out. So you say, see, the CEO is saying, this is reasonable. The government is now stepping in and paying our price. Sure. And everything's good. There is a reasonable price. Government pays it, and we're done. There is no march in basis. I can, if I can just break in here. In, in, in the previous cases where price has been an issue, the position the NIH has taken is that if the product is uh, uh, re, uh, is re, if there are evidence that the insurer companies are paying for it, uh, they consider that uh, the, 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 there's no problem. Yeah, there you go. So that that has been now, had it been the prep case, that would have been a harder thing to establish because there was not much evidence that the prep was available in the way that public health experts thought prep should have been utilized. But in terms of a therapy, an expensive therapy for for cancer or something like that, or multiple sclerosis, they've taken a position. No matter how high the price is, as long as the patients have access to it in the United States. Now, outside the United States, often that's not the case. So. Another issue that comes up in the grounds is whether or not you can use a marching case to establish that the price 
uh, creates a barrier to access and a lack of access outside the United States, whether or not, uh, because the Bayh-Dole Act doesn't have to be only on the pricing grounds or the reasonable pricing. There's these other things about in the Bayh-Dole Act and the marching grounds about, about, uh, uh, about the, um, uh, 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 the effect on, on, on health. Now, who, who, who counts whether they're in the United States or not outside the United States is, is an issue that is a little ambiguous. I know that in some of the contracts that have been done in the COVID area, the, the companies have gotten written into the contract that the government can only act to address a US problem and access, and they can't uh, uh, apply the standard to people outside the United States, but I think that's sort of something that is is a it's something that we've we've asked the government to consider whether or not uh, um, it would be different outside. I, I think uh, an example that would be Spinraza, for example, which is a, a drug that had initially uh, a, a, a very robust rights in the initial Orange Book patents on a small molecule that was done for spinal muscular atrophy, a product which was about $750,000 in the first year and $375,000 or something maintenance doses. It was an extremely expensive drug for primarily children that had a very terrible disease. And access in developing countries is almost non-existent. And so the question on, on that particular case would be, could you get a, 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 the US government to exercise the marching case on the grounds that outside the United States in developing countries and countries with lower incomes, there's almost no access to this, uh, th this treatment that was invented on NIH grants at Cold Spring Harbor and the University of uh, Massachusetts. Uh, there, there are, there, I, I think one, one, one thing that's true on the grounds issue, do you have good grounds is, the, the, I think the important thing to say is if you think you have a, a strong marching case about a particular thing, the, your first instinct is to think about how the march, how, how the case looks for your particular case you're looking at, the particular set of facts you have. From the point of view of the NIH or the Department of Defense or DOE or the Veterans Administration or who, whomever else may be controlling your rights in that product, what they're looking at is if they make a decision in this case and they set a precedent, how does that precedent scale when you look at other similar cases that are brought to you? Jamie, can I say something about that? Yes. Absolutely. I, mean, I guess there's there's two kinds of things we might be talking about. One is, is there a legal requirement that they set out in advance a standard that is clear and applies in every context and so forth? And that, I think that's, I'm not aware of that being the case, right? I mean, the statute says reasonable terms. And so the question is, what's reasonable? And of course, they have to have an answer, but they don't have to answer every case necessarily in advance, unless there's something I'm missing about that. But I think you're, you're the, this is kind of a policy question for the agency, and it's logical that they're thinking about that. You know, what's, what's the right approach to this? If we use it once, we will get asked to use it again. And, you know, I think there's different possible answers to that. To some extent, it's their problem. <laughs> You know, I mean, I, I, I have my view. I think that that we should think about this through the lens of, of the kind of innovation system that we want to have. If the government is paying a substantial amount of the price tag, part of the reason by dole rights makes sense is that then you've, you know, de-risked it and you've obviously substantially funded this invention. And so it should be more affordable. So, you know, I think that the way one ought to think about reasonableness is, you know, being authorizing the government to then get into the questions about what the costs of R&D were and ensuring that, you know, we ought to have, you know, enough compensation to make sure R&D is done, but not, not more. Um, that seems a reasonable approach to me. Um, but I wanted to ask a different question, and I'm sorry, because I had to jump off for a little bit because of a kid issue, which is, it might be useful to talk about some of this in, in and maybe this is already on the plan, you know, like in the context of some of these you know, really interesting new cases that may be on the table about whether it's some like, let's say emerging antivirals for COVID. Is that gonna be part of the agenda today to talk through some possible new areas where this is coming up and then attach, you know, kind of concretely work out what people know about different parts of that story? Absolutely. And I, I think that's a, that's a good suggestion. Um, in, in, that, in that respect, maybe we could start with one that's, uh, 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 one of the things that's kind of everyone's mind right now would be the, uh, how do you say it, Mal Malpunavir or uh, the, uh, the new? Mondopiravir. Mondopiravir. 
Yeah, I'm, I'm the worst person in the world at pronouncing it. And does anyone know whether they actually deliberately make those hard to say? Because I've heard that they do. Well, uh, in this particular case, where the, the, the price, the announced price from the contract for a completed treatment is, is under $1,000, $712 per treatment, which is less than remdesivir. It's less than the Regeneron uh, antibiotic treatment. And it's a uh, and it's, you know, it's re, the initial report said it's quite effective. And so uh, this is this would be a price would be a barrier in some countries, but it, it, I don't think it would be a barrier in the United States relative to the, um, uh, the, the, the benefits in terms of avoiding hospitalization and things like this. And what's your, what's, what's your thought on whether or not they would react to a, uh, just a pricing alone uh, case in terms of, uh, of this product? I, I think it'd be tough myself. You're asking me, Jamie? Yeah. Uh, so you're, 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 I guess what you're supposing is that if there's a lot of, let's say, social value in the product, because it actually works pretty well, the fact that there's a really big disconnect between the price and then what we assume, I guess we don't know in this case, but what the investment was is not going to be sufficient from the NIH's perspective. That's your concern. Well, I think I think it's going to it's going to turn out the amount of money spent on the drug is fairly small because the preclinical work is like that too. Government and the initial trial that uh, that was the safety trial was 130 um, healthy volunteers in England, which was not a very expensive trial. And the second second or third trial that Merck has done, those are not hugely expensive, and the market is massive. I mean, anything in COVID 19 that works, you have the biggest market. In the history of pharmaceuticals or vaccines out there, laying in front of you, I mean, it's 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 sort of a historic how big the potential market is. It may not last forever, but you know, I mean, it certainly is lasting longer than people wanted it to. So, I I, I see that particular problem in the problem that they they're doing voluntary licensing in about 118 countries for generic suppliers. So you'll have cheap generics available in those countries. Merck says, and the price in the U.S. Does not seem to be to put a put a put a put a, uh, a target on their back just yet, but we don't know how how many courses will be consumed at that point yet. But I imagine in Latin America it's going to be a real problem because uh, they're not going to be included in the voluntary licensing program. Their incomes are lower, and uh, and so one one question you would have could you, could would, would the U.S. government march in on the patents if they thought. That it was creating health problems outside the United States and in countries that were kind of middle-income countries, or what happens if the uh, the utilization just piles up in the United States if the returns are just insane? I would think. Uh, um, in that particular case, it's easy to get a supplier because there are generic supply there, there are generic APIs already available for the product, and the manufacturing problems. It's a small molecule, and the manufacturing uh, it just seemed to have been fairly well documented by third parties. Uh, well, an advantage of it is, is, sorry, do we know that margin rights attach with Molnupiravir? If we do, I mean, the advantage of a case like that is. There are, there are, yeah. I, 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 Luis did a, a patent analysis of all the patent applications that have been published so far, and every single one of them has declared government rights. Yeah, so, I mean, you know, the, the, the advantage is that it's not, to the extent that we've been hitting a wall on price, it's a supply issue, you know, in face of the, like the, the most the best publicized supply issue in history. So it it certainly increases pressure on on NIH to um, to take a different view. And in you know the Biden administration's recent uh, Basera and Biden's recent plan on lowering drug prices, they did at least commit to reviewing marching petitions. So we we got a couple things to go on there if we use that as a you know, as a as another test, another challenge. Yeah, I, I think even on the scaling of manufacturing, it's probably because they're 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 doing effectively technology transfer to some uh, pretty pretty capable Indian manufacturers. I think that's probably, um, but of course the global use is it's sort of unprecedented, right? Big, so maybe that's not not enough. But yeah, if there is a supply problem, that that could be compelling. Um, the Regeneron antibody, on the other hand, is, uh, is, is really expensive. And, uh, and, uh, uh, but in addition to the patent issues, which are kind of obscure in the, in the contracts with the US because they're redacted even what the patent numbers are, 
there's uh, the, the, the test here exclusivity is a problem. And uh, uh, there's always this issue of, of whether the patent landscape is sufficiently robust in terms of the margin to clear all the patents you have to clear. And, and, uh, and, and so you have this problem of clearing the non-patent rights in data. You have the problems of the know-how, access to the cell lines, and, uh, and, 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 and any background patents or any additional patents that the government doesn't have rights in for that one. I think that would be a, a more challenging case. Do we know what additional patents exist beyond the ones that government use attached to in that case? I don't, uh, Luis, uh, I, I know, uh, I mean, uh, and Catherine, I know that one of the problems we got, even in the government contract, they've, what, the, the main patent they got on the, on, on the antibody was, was filed after they got the government grant. But the, uh, uh, Catherine, are you the one that worked on the, the redaction issue on the, uh, the Regeneron contract? How, how did that play out? These were the new, new non vital contracts that they've been using for COVID. Go ahead, Catherine. I would say that Luis did the majority of the work on this, but um, it the, the main contract is an OTA. So it um, the government takes the position that the Bayadol Act is negotiable. Um, it's, it's optional, so they can just do away with it altogether or they can modify the terms. And for this Regeneron OTA, the definition of subject invention was partially redacted. And then Luis did an analysis of the, the patent landscape and reached out to Regeneron and said that we think that we have an excellent case for why Regeneron failed to disclose government rights in a subject invention. And um, with the timing working out that Regeneron had this funding agreement before it filed a patent application, Regeneron came back and responded that there was no subject invention. So there an issue can be whether or not the existence of an OTA um, precluded there being a subject invention or if Regeneron is using a separate accounting and trying to um, argue that private funds concede the invention and that's why it's not a subject invention. Um, but I don't know if Luis, you wanna add anything to that? No, that, yeah, so Regeneron says, yeah, we took government money, but we didn't use it to invent this particular treatment. We used it for something else. And so therefore this is not a subject invention, which is going back to the question of like, can they say separate accounting is a defense to failing to disclose, right? Um, to the patent landscape question, um, there are, uh, as I am aware, three patents that are all of them assigned to Regeneron. And I think they cover the compound and the method of treatment. Um, there may be you know, additional patents for, for foundational uh, antibody technology, but I think those are it basically. I would say uh, more generally on COVID, uh, uh, like if you look at Ma uh, Moderna, for example, we, we initially we took a look at uh, Moderna had something like 150 patents assigned to Moderna, separate from the patents where, where they were uh, kind of in-house sort of patents, as opposed to patents were licensed into them from third parties. But within those patents, they declared zero uh, 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 government rights in any of the patents. And uh, we, we saw this in, in, in some other companies. And we, we filed uh, 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 letters with, uh, with uh, uh, BARDA and with the NIH and the, and, and, and the, and the uh, Defense Department uh, DARPA program, which had funded a lot of the messenger RNA work. And we, we asked them, uh, in several of these early COVID products, we've asked them to investigate the failure to disclose. This is actually a pretty big problem is that people that get government grants do not disclose that they got government grants when they file the patents. The remedy in the Bayh-Dole Act is that the government can take possession of the patents and ownership of the patents if there was a failure to disclose. Failure to disclose is a pretty common pro problem that we found, um, but it's not enforced uh, uh, aggressively by any of the agencies. Most of the agencies have no systematic way of like monitoring these things. And when they do establish that there's a failure to disclose, usually all they require is that the person file an amendment to their patent to make a, a late disclosure. I think in the case of uh, Norvatus, once they made a disclosure about 14, 20, you know, years later, something like that, and there was really no sanction on it. So that, that's one of the challenges you've got is, is, is basically underreporting um, on, on some of these patents. Uh, going back to Mal. Uh, uh, 
How do you say malt? malt? How do you how do you say the new Merck drug? On the Piravir. On the Piravir. Right. Um, um, uh, Melissa Barber, she's on on the call here. She uh, uh, she she's co-author of a study that said it costs about twenty dollars to make uh, the treatment. That they're selling for seven hundred and twelve dollars. So, given the number of people worldwide, uh, they're they're getting uh, having having uh, getting sick with 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 COVID. Um, it, it would seem like a it would seem like driving the price down to marginal cost would be a good thing, right? Uh, 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 I just wondered, Melissa, could you just explain a little bit about what your research was on the on the cost of manufacturing? If you're still on a, or is Melissa dropped off the call? I think oh, Melissa Barber, you're on the call. Cannot hear you, Melissa. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Melissa is is uh, is Melissa speaking right now? Or is she? She's resolving her mic issues. Mic issue. Hi, can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you now. Is that working now? Okay, I don't know why the camera's working, but that's probably for the best. Uh, so the twenty bucks is super super high. We posted the um. Oh, sorry, I'll just start from the beginning. So this uses um, import export data. And when we started doing the analysis, um, what we do in there is a new molecule is we try to find molecules that are similar in structure and similar in synthesis. But then we just got really lucky and it was already moving around. Um, the, the database has a lag because India changed their law about two years ago. So now we have to use a private database. Um, so the last shipment that we could see was July 31st, 2021. So the API prices that we are using for the like the general formula for pills, which we've done for for hundreds of medicines, um, is from July, which is just like shockingly old. Prices will have gone down a lot. So the twenty bucks is is really really conservative. So we included another number. So there was a a PhD student at MIT, possibly a postdoc. Sorry, I'm not really sure. One of those. Anyway, she um, wrote a paper on a new method of synthesis, estimating and just as an incidental thing, estimated the the synthesis price and, and that's where you get the kind of four bucks. It's only five pills. And like, when you think of how much it costs to make other antivirals, um, it, it will be lower than 20 bucks. Sorry, I don't know if that's really straightforward. Just, just a note though, for anyone on the call, um, this database is stupidly expensive. It's like 5,000 bucks. And we got a grant from um, an NGO to do this. I'm very happy to share data with, with anyone here. Please just email me, I'll, I'll send you whatever you want. And, and, and just to sort of be kind of concrete about what the dilemma is here right now, if this is in fact as effective as they say, and it can prevent, uh, I, I think in their control group, they had no deaths from people that used uh, 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 this product infections compared to the, the, the people that didn't have it where, where there were a, a fair amount of deaths. That means that if it's not deployed widely, that a lot of people will die that would not otherwise die. So it's a life and death policy issue about whether or not to make this product available widely and cheaply throughout the globe or, or not. And uh, uh, th there's no question about the fact that, that Merck and, and, and Rich, Richback are gonna get um, uh, plenty of money from this product. They're not gonna go broke or anything like that. They've already got a contract for over a billion dollars from the US government. I think that's just a start. So it's really a question of will there be any significant interventions by the government to scale manufacturing. And one of the good things about this, uh, uh, following up on, on Peter's comments, is, is, that, is that this is something that where uh, the know-how is not a major challenge like it is, for example, in, in, in some of the vaccines or some of the biologic products like, uh, like the Regeneron antibiotic. It's something where they can scale pretty fast and it's, it's less of a barrier. So in, in, in that sense, uh, scaling the production at a very low price would, would have a, a, a very positive impact on health. The question is how well, in, in a way, does this particular statute um, fit that? And, and, and it could be that the remedies would take place outside the United States. Maybe the, the, the most important remedies will take place not in the United States, but in developing countries using their own flexibilities and their laws, not dependent on government funding, but just based on compulsory licensing laws in their own countries to act. Can I just point out one just detail that actually I think is material is that when the government is contracting with a large company, it is not under 
Bayh-Dole, the statute. It's under an executive branch memorandum of the president backed up by an executive order. And in that memorandum, you have the following language. An award's not subject to Bayh-Dole, any of the rights of the government or obligations of the performer described in 35 USC 202 to 204, that's what we're talking about, including Marchand, may be waived or omitted if the agency determines that the interests of the United States and the general public will be better served thereby as, for example, where this is necessary to obtain a uniquely or highly qualified performer, or that the award involves co-sponsored cost sharing or joint venture research and development and the performer um, is making substantial contribution of funds, facilities, or equipment to, or, to the work performed under the award. This is not vital statutory language, but these are two big exceptions that the government reserves for itself to be able to deal with large companies not under the statute, even though the implementing regulations by NIST conflate the by dole responsibilities of small companies and nonprofits with the practices that are appropriate in the default for large companies. So when we talk about Merck and a government contract, while by Dole the statute is there, the government has in its executive branch policies uh, flexibility that isn't in by Dole. And somebody could just say, we've chosen to waive those requirements. 203 is within 202 to 204, and we're waiving it. So you can petition all you want to. But you'll have to have something other than the technical aspects of a petition to somehow ask us, the executive branch, to voluntarily bring ourselves under the protocols of marching. Well, in terms, in terms of, uh, it, it's an important point that, and I, I often kind of overlooked that the Bidol Act itself applies to small businesses and to universities and nonprofit organizations, and that big companies like Merck are only treated that way normally or Pfizer because of the uh, because of this uh, uh, executive order or this administ you know this administrative discretionary policy which does have these exceptions that said a lot of cases that we've looked at the rights are held really uh, were acquired by nonprofit organizations so Emory is a nonprofit organization Emory is uh, the initial holder of the patents on on this particular product and if you look at the uh, 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 some of the other drugs we've looked at, for example, in spinal muscular atrophy or different areas, a lot of these things are licensed from universities to bigger companies. And so in, in those cases, the Bayh-Dole Act would be the controlling factor. But, but it, it, this is sort of a minefield that's kind of important is people start with the assumption that the Bayh-Dole Act is, is a controlling legal uh, structure. And that, that's a really a good assumption to start with. But then you have to, in some cases, it will, it will, it will, there, there will be uh, an other transaction authority agreement, the OTA, which is used for a lot of the COVID work, or it'll be uh, uh, the kind of things that Gerald just talked about that, that, may, that may come to play. Um, I, I don't think these are the, the most important problems in, in most of these cases. Usually the, the bigger problem is, do you have in the beginning, do you have a, a, a grounds that's persuasive for the government on a policy ground? Secondly, uh, do you have uh, enough, enough rights in the patent? What happens if there are rights that you don't have uh, rights in, like a, a case where the government has rights in like half the patents, but in half the patents were done without federal funding and you have no rights in what do you do in those cases? And another issue would be on this issue whether or not the extended appeals can frustrate the whole thing because you wouldn't want to wait for all the appeals to go through it. And there's, there's two issues that I think I'd like people to talk about. It. Is, I don't know if Amy is still on the call because I know that she had to, yeah, I think. Uh, it, yep, I'm here. So I, I wonder if you could just talk a little bit about the case when you've got a mixed case where you have some patents, essentially the Bayh-Dole Act, and you have a the government has a royalty-free right and they have a marching right, but they have some other uh, patents which are completely private, and how 1498 uh, authority might work with the Bayh-Dole Act in those cases. Sure. Yeah. Um... So, I mean, I guess it, I think it's really important to appreciate that the government has a much bigger authority in, in, in 28 U.S.C. 1498. That's a provision that allows the U.S. government to use patents of any kind, whether they have had government investments in them or not. It provides that the government cannot be enjoined or stopped from infringing patents and that only a reasonable royalty is due. 
And so in combination, by Dolan 1498, I think really make it feasible to use and in fact to use pretty quickly a, um, a, a series of patents in a, a combination of ones that had marching rights attached to them and private patents. And of course, that's not uncommon where you have a situation where the government has some patents, but there's also private sector patents. And the way 1498 <coughs> works is quite straightforward. It's used a lot in, in the defense sector. And there's even some historical uses of it in the context of, of drugs in the sense that the government is a, government procurement officers are allowed to procure things. And it's sort of like nobody can stop them, um, except you can, you know, if you believe that they're infringing a patent, you have to go to the Court of Federal Claims, make your case, the government can argue that they are, um, uh, you know, your patent is invalid, they can make all the usual arguments they would. But, um, but because the federal government can't be enjoined for infringing a patent, um, you know, it does have the potential to speed things up, um, I think, as compared to the piece that you're talking about, Jamie, and also to make it possible to use, um, uh, to use generics in contexts where there are some government rights, but not complete government rights. So there's complicating questions about how you get through the FDA side of the story, because 28 U.S.C. 1498 applies to patents, but there may also be regulatory exclusivities and, of course, questions about approval um, or authorization from the FDA. So I'm not sure we need to get into those, but but I think your point, Jamie, about the the, the, the conjoined use of these two is really, really important to appreciate. Um, you know, in some sense, Baidol is there. Um, I think of it as a means to lower the government's payments under 1498, because if the government has substantially funded the research, then the amount of royalties due would presumably be less. Um, but really, um, you know, it's in a way, um, I think um, that's guess how I think about the two of them working together. Is that, is that what you wanted me to? That's perfect. Yeah. So, so the, the cases are that if you, if it's a, per, a purely private patent, you have to go to a judge and find out at some later date what the judge thinks you're going to have to pay the patent order for using without permission some patent under 1498. And that can, be a deterrent for some agencies if they just don't like the uncertainty or they don't really know what you know the judges are going to do these days. I mean, it, it, it shouldn't really, it, it becomes a bigger problem, I think, if it's a bigger number potentially than if it's a smaller number, but it, it, it eventually. So where you have, if you have some sort of minor patents on the back end that the company contributed in a major government contribution, you would have less of a liability. I think it is, at least the research that I've done suggests to me though that you know, the agencies that say they're worried about the liability, I mean, they're, I think, you know, the, when you get sued under 1498, the money is not going to come from the agency. It's going to come, I believe, from the general judgment fund. And so in that sense, they have more to pay if they pay up front in a licensing deal than they do actually if they get sued just as an agency. Um, uh, at least that's my, that's my understanding of how this would work. And, 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 and if the government has rights in the patents, if the government if it's if it's said that the use is buyer for the U.S. government, the, under a fourteen ninety eight case, the government owes nothing. And if the government exercises its marching rights, it's limited by statute to a reasonable royalty, which is a much less challenging uh, thing for an agency to consider. So, you're right. That, that, so that the two the two together are a situation. So if the agency says, "I won't do the marching right because you can't clear all the patents," you can say do the margin rights, we'll worry about the other patents later because we have other remedies to do with the other patents which are more appealing to the government if we've cleared the Bayh-Dole patents than if we haven't, right? I mean, because it's uh, it just makes it uh, that much uh, less costly for the government to pursue that. The other thing is on appeal, it's a similar situation. Uh, uh, in the Washington Post, our Kessler kind of, uh, 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 went on a bit about how if, if you can't exercise the remedy of a margin right until you until you pursue all your appeals. And the, the, the sort of the idea is that that might take a really long time, but that would be a discourage, uh, it would discourage people from using the margin request because you'd have to wait a long time before you could get um, any benefit from having even succeeded at the administrative level because the appeals can take time. But the government has some flexibility because if they have a royalty free right in the patents, they could actually authorize a generic manufacturer to make the drugs uh, and pay nothing to the patent owner while the appeal goes through because the, the margin requires the payment of a royalty, but the royalty for your right does not. So the government could say, if you're going to jerk us around in the appeal, that's fine, but we'll authorize the royalty for your right and you get nothing. 
until your appeal is settled, and then and then and then you'll you'll roll over to the marching request, and you get a reasonable royalty if, if you know if, if you win. And so, I think that gives the government leverage uh, in, in the case. So, if the Xtani case was decided, for example, now uh, by the Department of Defense and the company to appeal it, the Department of Defense would be able to say, for purposes of of, of, of the Medicare program, where, where most of the extending sales are actually done through the Medicare program, um, we're going to authorize generic producers to, to import to the United States from existing manufacturers that are out there and, and, and serve that market. And we'll do that while the appeal uh, goes on. Because essentially, the decision the government has is there's more than one way to break the monopoly. One is the use of the royalty free right they have in the past. This is something also that. Aaron Kesselheim, I think Amy has also written about this issue, and, and, as we, and, and we certainly sometimes bundle a marching request with a request, and we've done this with, with public citizen before too. We said that you should, you should exercise either the marching right or the royalty for right, whatever's necessary to break the monopoly. If the company doesn't appeal, the marchants has some benefits to the company because they get a royalty. But the margin also has some benefits to the government because it doesn't have to argue whether the use is for or by the US government. A margin can go to any market, whether the government has an interest in supplying that market or not. It could go into the uh, bicycle market. It could go into any market it wants to. But if you want to use the government rights, you have to sort of tie the use some way into a government program. With drugs, it's because there's so much government involvement in the, in, 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 in the drug area, it's easier, and if the drugs on Medicare or Medicaid, it's much easier, I think. But it's sort of an uncharted area as to how far 1498 or the government use right can extend into areas where they might argue that there's some boundary for what considers a government use, whereas the margin right is not limited in that respect. So that's that's that's. I, 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 I'm sorry, it sounds so complicated, but but. Uh, we're, we're all like, go ahead and do it, you know, and then and, and just kind of figure out, use all the rights you have and sort of, and focus on the bigger question, should you break the monopoly or not break the monopoly, and then sort out the legal issues later. But uh, agencies a lot of times will look at the legal issues and excuse not to act, and they'll try and point out sort of specific things. Uh, are, are there any questions about this, this issue of, of either the combination of the government use right under the general statute that the US government can use any patent at once for any purpose at once, as long as it's related to use for by the government that Amy was talking about. Um, I know that Public Citizen is, is one of the groups that's worked a lot on this issue as well, right? Uh, Stephen or, or, or Zane, you guys have done a lot of Peter on the 1498 front. Yeah. It has the advantage if it applies to all patents. It's not limited to ones where the government had some funding or subject convention. All yeah, we found the flexibility to you know to be advantageous and and clear. You know, the, the ability of the government to just to just act and not have to make the proofs, making it somewhat more of a political question. Though you know, acknowledge you've got the issues about royalties and, and how you reach the private market. Um, you know, which we, we think are solvable in areas like you know, advantage mar margin being you sort of reach the full market rather than just public programs. And you know, we hope that through 1498, you know, among other things, the government can, can choose to create a program, for example, um, like a Kinder Ryan White or something so that you are making drugs available to everyone um, through through 1498. Could we... Um, could we talk a little bit about, um, I mean, given what the track record has been over the last 25 years in uh, through various administrations, reluctance to do, to take up march in cases. And the Biden administration for the moment seems to have put its eggs in um, negotiation by Medicare of, of drug prices, you know, if that ends up somehow as, as part of reconciliation. Um, how all this relate, I mean, the, the, I mean, it's good that the administration has, has signaled to, to NIST to, 
you know, uh, put, it on, put it on pause, but that's hardly a, a ringing endorsement of marching rights. And given that uh, DOD since April, you know, I've heard nothing on the on the Extandi petition. Um, I, I think if if nothing happens with Medicare um, being able to negotiate prices, then I think this is our best shot. But if if that is going to take center stage, and we've also had the Biden administration not favoring um, reference to to foreign drug pricing. So, but can we talk a little bit about how this fits into the larger context? And it would be interesting to hear from those of you who are closer to what's happening um, uh, with the Biden drug pricing plan that was recently announced. I think I think one, one thing that, uh, uh, one of the reasons why that Martian right is so, controversy among players is even though it's kind of only applies to a, a limited number of products uh, potentially uh, although some of them are quite important uh, 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 it, it, it is because it's it's seen as a precedent of a way to address pricing problems because once the government for whatever mechanism they use whether it's 1498 or it's the bite all act or the royalty for right as long as they are antitrust if they break the monopoly and you observe lower prices coming out they think that it'll catch on, you know, that people will see it as, as, as a tool that they will expand beyond the, 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 the limited scope of, of the Bidol Act. The Bidol Act, by the way, is a very limited compulsory license act compared to most countries. Most countries have a general compulsory licensing statute at, at a very minimum in the health area, which has nothing to do with government funding. It just applies to all products. And it's a uh, it's, it's, it's written in a more favorable way than I think even 1498 in some respects, uh, but the U.S. doesn't. So, so they, they think, I think they think maybe it, it might, um, that, that's one of the reasons why it's controversial. But I think that the, 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 the current uh, public citizen, you, know, you guys, uh, John Hassel, some of you guys are on the call here are working very much on the Hill. It seems to me that the drug pricing reforms are not doing that well right now. Is that correct? That's correct, Jamie. They're I mean, we're, we're supporting, um, along with Public Citizen and many other groups, um, giving power to Medicare to negotiate drug prices per HR 12, uh, HR 3. But the reality is, even if it passes in the House, it doesn't stand much of a chance in the Senate. And, um, but we we're, we're definitely think it's, it's a, a rallying cry uh, for the drug pricing movement. And I, I defer to Peter and and Steve, if they've gone to say anything else about that. I would, yeah, I, I would say, I, I would generally associate myself with what John just said. I, th I think that it's, there's, um, you know, it's where it ultimately lands remains to be seen. It's certainly, you know, I mean, folks kind of familiar with the debate from a couple of years ago know well that we were not completely satisfied with, with what was included in HR3 and think that it has numerous shortcomings. And, you know, it's almost, uh, foregone conclusion to what we what ultimately advances and I am optimistic that we will have some drug pricing reform advance as part of reconciliation but what ultimately advances is probably going to be you know weaker than what HR3 was in a number of respects um, nonetheless you know it, it, it's still you know I think it is still going to take hundreds of billions of dollars of revenues out of the pharmaceutical industry over the course of like a decade and you know going forward um, you know, it, it's going to be significant for a lot of people and produce a lot of savings that could be used in other ways. But there are also some worrying sort of things circulating about how policies might deviate from what came out of the uh, out of the House Ways and Means Committee. Steve, something you've pointed out to me before, I think, right, is that we don't get the benefits of negotiation until 2025, even if it passes, right? <laughs> is that right? Oh, my God, that's terrible. <laughs> So, it is. And I mean, and I think it's informative for this conversation too. Like, I mean, it takes time for them to, to set up the process and so on. And they rely on getting some, you know, it, it takes time to work it, work through the somewhat convoluted system we have that um, in Medicare Part D. But, 
you know, it's all the more reason for the administration to think more seriously about using the mechanisms that it has, like margin rights um, and other sort of vital rights to help expand access to medicines. Well, I, I would say if the if the pending extending case, like, here's here's the advantages it has. Like, you have uh, uh, you have pretty robust rights in the patents. Initially, all the patents. I mean, but there's you know I haven't like I mean I think Luis like more recently at whether some follow-on patents. Basically, robust rights. You're, you're past the test ad exclusivity period. That's not a problem. There's no orphan drug exclusivity. It's it's not an orphan drug, and even though it's been on the market for a while, it's generating billions of dollars. The pricing increase is, is ridiculous. It's like three to five times more expensive. It's not like 15% more. It's like multiples more. It's 150 grand a year for one of the most common forms of cancer there is. The, the most common forms are prostate cancer, breast cancer, and, and lung cancer. And it's one of those three. And it's something that uh, every man gets, if he gets old enough, it's, it's scary. And then uh, you have a, one of the applicants is a Vietnam veteran, my, my, my brother, you know, and uh, you've got uh, 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 generic suppliers, uh, uh, ma major Indian suppliers right now are manufacturing the drug. So you, you can find suppliers. There's no test ad exclusivity issue. There's no sort of technology transfer barriers. They made billions of dollars on the thing. It's a completely ridiculous price. It was invented at UCLA on grants from the army and the NIH. And so the, the downside is if you lose this case, that's also a precedent. I mean, it, it's, it, it just means that like even this case won't win, right? So then, then what's your next case? So this, this should be like a layup. You know, this, this is like low hanging fruit. If this one doesn't work, then how do you go to uh, products where you have more problems than you have in this one, where you have more barriers to entry? So I think that uh, uh, it's out there. And, and it, it, if the administration just, it'd be like Trump is gonna promise to do something about drug prices this whole term and never, got, never quite got it done. Uh, uh, Biden and his in the uh, the cancer moonshot thing, and they kept saying that drug prices was something that had to deal with later. They never got around to it. It seems like politicians run for office; they promise to do something about drug prices, but it's always manana. Uh, you know, well, you know, the campaign ca contributions kind of flow in. So I think it, it, it would be important to ram this. There's some other cases though that people can, uh, you know, certain the COVID cases are going to get people to get a close look at those things particularly not just the US impact, but the global impact as well. But I wanna show you, if I can, Luis did some data on uh, just, I, he, he, he looked at data on, on what other products have bidol margin rights associated, but he also looked at when cases when they have both bidol rights and non bidol rights. And I'm gonna share my screen right now if I can. And, and uh, uh, let's see if I can make this work here. Can you, can you all see this uh, screen right now? Is this, is this something you can? Yes. Okay. Yep. So uh, the, first, the first group of drugs here, and th this is not, this is partial. There, there are more patents on more drugs that have government rights than what's shown on this sheet. But this shows an example of some that are out there. Now, he has uh, two types of drugs here. One are called NDAs. Those are drugs sometimes referred to as small molecules, and they're done under a different regulatory regime than biologic drugs. The biologic drugs, the problem with the biologic drugs is there's a 12-year period when you cannot rely upon the uh, clinical evidence that drugs are safe and effective to register a generic or biosimilar version of them. And the, and the regulatory pathway for a biologic drug is much more challenging and expensive than it is for small molecules. So I'll start with the small molecules. Also, the patent landscape is much clearer on the small molecule drugs because they have something called the Orange Book. And in the Orange Book, the companies list the patents that they say uh, you'd have to infringe if, if you made the product. So in this sheet, and, and we'll share, uh, Luis, can you put a, a link to the sheet in the, uh, in the chat so other people can just pull it up themselves and look at it? This column N is called government patents, GovT patents. These are patents where the company, the patent holder themselves have declared, and this doesn't count for cases where they're like shirking their disclosure thing. In this case, there's no dispute about it. They have in fact said, these are our patents. You know, government has grants in these things and they say which grants they are. So these are examples of drugs that have one or more patent where they, uh, they say the patent has some government rights. 
But this other column here, oh, this is a problem column. This is the this is the column where they say there's additional patents the government doesn't have rights in. So in the first one, here, what's not the, this is the first one? Yeah, this is in a Loxapine or whatever it's called. Um, they say that uh, uh, there, there's a brand name, um, Addis about whatever it is. They, they list like four patents that have government rights, but then they list a bunch of patents that don't. Now, often uh, it, it depends. You have to look at sometimes the, uh, the 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 extra patents are important, and sometimes they're not important. They could be minor tweaking of the product. Um, they could be dose patents. that could be busted. They could be a lot of things. But you have to kind of look at for each one. But you do see that there's a fair amount of products. Now, Spin Rossi here, uh, uh, it first came on, it, this is a product that's really, really expensive and has a huge access problems for this product, particularly around the world. And it's, a, it's a, one of the things that we're concerned about because the parents of the kids, they contact us about getting access to this particular drug. When it first came in the market, uh, all but one of the patents had some government rights disclosed. Um, and, and we thought they should have disclosed it. We thought it was a non-disclosure case, but now they have additional patents which have been filed, which were filed, which appeared later, and we have to evaluate those patents to see if they're a problem. Um, there are some cases where there's just uh, uh, no 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 secondary patents, but this is one of the problems you have to do margin right. You have to go through these sort of things and see if there's cases where the patents in column M are sufficient to justify a march in. By the agency that funded it, which often but not always will be the National Institutes of Health. The other agencies that you'll see pop on this thing could include DARPA, it could include uh, BARDA, it could include the CDC, the FDA, the Veterans Administration, depart different parts of the Department of Defense, but, but often it'll be the NIH. I think it's going on with the NIH is that Francis Collins is going to, uh, 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 is going to leave, and Francis Collins has been like a complete very aggressive opponent of any use of, of, of marching rights so far. And it, 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 you know, some people may think it's not, it's not Francis, he's relying upon his staff, but when Francis, before he was working at the NIH, he was working at the University of Michigan, and he patented uh, the, cystic, the, cystic, uh, uh, the cystic fibrosis gene. And in the discussions on the license the gene, he was quite active in those discussions. And uh, Robert D, uh, Cook Deegan has written about this. And he was quite insistent that if the patent on the gene, he agreed that if it was used for a diagnostic, it could be non-exclusive. If it was, uh, there should be some space for research uses of cystic fibrosis. But he thought they should reserve the right to go to exclusive if it's for a therapeutic, for a drug. And that's very consistent with the position he's taken as the head of the NIH, that when it comes to a drug or a vaccine, that they should be able to go with a monopoly, a very strong, robust monopoly, subject to no price constraints. Uh, aiding them in a lot of this discussion has been uh, Mark Roba, who's his, his aide and works for him and is, has been around longer than, in this area, longer than, than Francis has been along. And the two of them are collectively very strong opponents of any use at the NIH of any marching rights or some of the other remedies that they have. But Francis at least will be replaced by the end of the year. So we'll have to kind of wait to see. The other thing is that the Secretary of Health has, has actually himself petitioned for a march in as recently as last year on Redemsevier when he was Attorney General for the state of California. And, and, and he's technically, I think, the boss, right? I mean, uh, so um, we'll have to see how that plays out because we haven't really, our, our, our people really, having conversations with the people close to the secretary at this point on the drug pricing team. I don't know, public citizen or John or any people, other people on this call are very close to the, this is an open public recorded call. So I know there's a limit to what you can say, but uh, I will say we are not actually ourselves. Uh, uh, we don't really know the people in the secretary's office on the drug pricing front. I can say that there was a listening session you know, before the report came out where several groups articulated pretty, I would argue, relatively similar concerns about the monopolistic conditions of the, uh, the American medicine market and, you know, what that, what that means for access and price and, and the, uh, the, the need for much stronger action from the U.S. government. Um, so there's that. And of course, you know, the, but the pricing plan that actually came out 
you know, very significantly under util, under uses under references these rights. It's kind of like everyone who's working on drug pricing right now um, in the federal government and around it is a little bit held up um, by the by the legislative expectations. You know, there, it's it's incumbent on everyone in the Democratic Party to try and pass that and to focus their energy on passing legislation, or at least, you know, within the administration. And so that that has folks' attention. And it's also the primary political piece that they're selling. So you know, we felt that, like that the administration's plan was much longer on legislative fixes than it was the power that the government actually already has in hand to fix the problem. And it did, of course, include um, a number of executive mechanisms, but not really these, like the treatment of, of Marchin or other issues to deal with uh, monopoly problems was um, was was you know both brief and and very modest. This is only um, putting just a finer point on something that Peter mentioned too, um, but there has been reporting suggesting that like the the head of uh, of CMS has stated that they they are looking for uh, looking you know they're considering a number of executive uh, measures to lower drug prices, but they're kind of waiting to see where things land with the legislation before um, before really moving in a serious way with any of that. Um, similarly, I think with the Collins resignation announcement, um, you know, I think it's unlikely that the administration is going to fill that position in a permanent way. Um, quickly, I think it's likely it's almost certain that we're going to get on the other side of reconciliation and at least closer to the end of the year before we see any sort of movement on that. If if we were to get a hearing on the uh, if we were to get a hearing on the uh, Extandy petition, just a hearing like the the the, the previous hearing in two thousand four that the NIH had was was a, a pack a pack full of uh, uh, reporters and journalists and it attracted a lot of attention because. Uh, congressional committees, they, they hear about things and they, maybe something happens or it doesn't happen, but it, it has a long path from having a hearing and actually becoming a law or having an, an actual effect. An administrative hearing where they already have discretion is going to go one way or the other, and it's it, it, in a way, it's sort of a more immediate thing. It could have a positive educational value in discussing compulsory licensing because it would attract a lot of attention because it would not be sort of a far-fetched thing. And, and if, they, if once they go into a hearing, they got to do something. Uh, right now, uh, uh, since 2004, they haven't held any hearings on any Martian requests. There's only two that have been hold, held in the last 40 years on, on, on Martian requests, one at the Department of Energy um, uh, on the, uh, the Ventana. Uh, request and the other one is on the Ratonic Progress 2004. So it would be really helpful. Uh, Robert, you said that you had uh, a letter from Seth Malton on that. Well, yeah, I mean, he he put in a letter to Secretary Austin uh, at the end of July, beginning of August, uh, urging that they grant administrative hearing. Now, this was before he made his uh, uh, unauthorized trip to Afghanistan, you know, during August. So probably in terms of, of um, you know, receptivity at DOD, I, I'm not sure that's going to carry the day. I think, I think there needs to be, you know, a lot more congressional interest and support for having um, uh, administrative hearing on the Zandi, on the Sandy petition than that single letter. And as of about a week or 10 days ago, uh, that office had not heard anything back. I'm happy to share the letter with you. It, you know, it do doesn't, th that he sent doesn't say all that much. Um, Elizabeth, Elizabeth Warren and, and some other senators sent a, a different letter on, 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 the, on these issues as well. And that's what sparked the Washington Post. Um, Mm -hmm. uh, commentary because I think that uh, Joe Allen um, and his crowd like uh, said it was that it was uh, it deserved a Pinocchio that they thought it was uh, that she, she didn't know what she was talking about and he had this uh, actually a fairly well researched I uh, was a surprisingly well researched piece for general newspaper on the topic he did quite a bit of reading on it and uh, 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 
so um, I think Elizabeth Warren's office had a bit of turnover recently, though, on this particular topic, on this particular issue. Um, but um, she's on the Armed Services Committee, and uh, so there's, uh, and she's your constituent, Robert. Uh, <laughs> I'm her constituent, but yes, it's mutual. <laughs> Um, Robert Robert uh, lives in the Boston area right now, so he's in, he's uh, in her backyard. Um, uh, in terms of marching cases that people are, are that, that we're thinking about, we're thinking a, 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 a bit on the rare disease front. And uh, on the rare disease fronts, it's a it's a situation where companies will come up with just prices that bear no particular relationship to anything. I mean. If a company says a, 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 it's going to be a hundred thousand dollars, or one million, or two million, or four million, it's almost like nobody's really questioning the price. They just go into kind of a negotiation about whether they're going to pay it or not, but without any sort of idea that someone should actually intervene to say that the price is inappropriate. Now, if 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 if, if it's for a a popular disease where a lot of people suffer from it, in the old days they used to say, well, there should be some sort of formal economic analysis of whether an ICER analysis or something like that to see if to see if this is uh, the amount of money per quality that you pay for a product is reasonable. But for a rare disease, that's kind of a number that gets thrown out the window because they they, they uh, implicit in a reasonable amount of money per quality adjusted life year is that it's a common disease. And when you have a rare disease, the feeling is that the number must be higher, but nobody knows how high because you have fewer patients. And people don't really do the math. They don't sort of say, oh, you have fewer patients. How many fewer patients do you do? And often it's the case that the number of patients you end up in a rare disease are larger than they, they thought they were going to be. If you look at Gleeve, for example, the number of patients they ended up with was a much larger number than what was initially used to justify the initial price, which rose anyway. But nonetheless, they started out with estimated a, very, a fairly small number of patients. If you have... Uh, so Zolgenza right now, which is a, uh, a $2.1 million gene therapy that takes about 90 minutes that was developed on government grants um, at the, at the uh, uh, Nationwide Children's Hospital in Ohio. And that particular product, it's uh, 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 it, it initially started out by sort of describing as a fairly small number of patients, but now they want to have uh, screening of every newborn baby to find if they, if they have the gene and to go into gene therapy immediately, which is a good thing for people because I think the efficacy is much greater if it's therapy is introduced at an earlier period. Um, but the number of patients are gonna get it, they're gonna, they're gonna go way up if, 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 if that kind of screening takes place. And, that got, and they're lobbying for that kind of screening now in Australia and Europe and all over the world. And so you've got big changes in the number of patients that are being treated not only here, but throughout the high income countries anyhow, and in the Latin American countries where they can litigate access, which is a more common thing in Latin America. So uh, uh, part of the issue is they're just lacking a methodology for saying what's an, what, what is an excessive price for a rare disease? Because I, I, I would go back to this thing. I think you have to sort of look more at the revenue and not just the price because the price doesn't really mean anything for a rare disease because uh, it's going to be a big number. Uh, okay, I think everyone, people can kind of accept that. But how big is, is where you know the, the problem comes up, and uh, and so getting into the methodology of how you sort of evaluate high prices, uh, I think is a major challenge for not just marching requests, but for all of these interventions into drug prices, whether the price controls, fourteen ninety eight or whatever, because. It, it you know it, 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 it it's it's easy to say that the price is wrong. It's it's pretty hard to say what the price is is right. That's essentially the problem. And it's hard to get a consensus on that because uh, there isn't that much interest in sort of move, moving toward that number. And for a lot of countries, it's not important. Like if you're the UK or Ireland or Australia, you can do whatever you want. It doesn't affect the whole world innovation system. But if the United States makes a policy. It changes everything because we're such a big footprint in the overall R and D phase, and that's why it's harder to do things here than it would be in, in a different country. But I think that the marching cases are kind of a, a place where you can experiment because you know it's sort of not affecting everything, and your cases where there's already a big public subsidy to begin with. 
So you, you're kind of experimenting with models of excessive pricing, I think, in the, in the margin space and trying to find things that are kind of in, where you can actually implement them. You can you know, put them into effect and you can make them work without a huge risk to the whole innovation system at this point, because it's, it, it's, it's a relatively small footprint as opposed to applying them to everything. Even, even Medicare negotiations is, 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 is somewhat limited since about 85% of population doesn't qualify for Medicare right off the bat. And it's, a, it, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's actually a, not even a huge part of the overall US market. Uh, but, but it's certainly bigger than the Marchand thing is uh, uh, by, by a big Marchand. So that's sort of one, one talking point you'd have to people in the government is they should play around a bit more with the Marchand cases. Because if something like Peter says, you can do it right now. You don't have to wait around until 2055 you know, or something like that to do anything. 25, 25. But it, but, it, but it is an important point for anyone who missed it that like if, the negoti if, if we succeed in getting Medicare negotiation passed in several years to the benefits, Till the benefits accrue and you know as steve was saying like if biden wants to notch a drug pricing victory that improves people's lives if you know we want to improve people's lives before then then you got to look at some of these um, executive tools i i just want to mention um jamie in, in addition to steve's comment in the chat but, so gabrielle's got a question for you for you here gabrielle is a if you don't mind me saying gabrielle is is a journalist it's probably worth we're saying before you go in on this, but it references the comment you made at the at the top of the meeting about the role of Francis Collins' departure. You know, it's certainly that's certainly significant. You know, to us in terms of both opportunities and the imperative of the Biden administration to change course. So, you know, I don't, I don't know if that's a, a comfortable thing to address here to to any degree. I think it's I think it's much easier for the NIH to have a change of policy. <laughs> Collins is not there because it would be an embarrassment for Collins in some respects, although he has such a he has so much a claim and he has such a great reputation. I mean, it's not going to like be a big stain on him. Most people won't even notice it. But like he would be somewhat embarrassed if there's a if, if Biden publicly kind of overturns his is his, his like 12 years of opposition to these things or something like that. So, yeah, I think it would it would it would be a, kind of a easier to do if, if he wasn't there. Um, I know that the staff. I had a meeting at the NIH not that long ago where I was brought up to talk about things. And then there was one, one, one person that worked, worked with uh, Mark that uh, wanted to talk to me afterwards. And, and then at a certain point, she said, well, I, I, uh, that she, she had to sort of cut off the conversations because she said she came from a, a home with divorced parents. And she felt like the conversation between Mark Robach and, and myself was like talking to people going through a divorce or something like that. And I, I cause it was so, so painful and personal. I, I didn't know what she was talking about because I, I barely know this guy. And, and all we do is file these petitions with the NIH on things that are just basic stuff. Like, like should somebody have disclosed the patent on the spinal muscular atrophy drug or is this price reasonable? or can we find out the cost of a clinical trial or something like that? But the NIH is very defensive about anyone questioning your policies on transparency, on drug pricing, and on monitoring uh, the enforcement of the disclosure requirements to the extent that it's almost dysfunctional at this point. It's almost impossible for us to have conversations uh, with them. And it, it's weird because we don't have those problems with other federal agencies. We have a great relationship with people in the patent office. We have a great relationship with USTR, with uh, the copyright office, with people in the State Department. We can talk to you know diplomats and you know people throughout the government, Department of Commerce, etc. This is the only agency where we meet this kind of weird stonewalling kind of behavior we have, and. You got you to kind of wonder what's going on over there because they were so close to the industry and they protect them in so many different ways. Like they'll put out a license on exclusive license for a cancer therapy where they've already done the, the trial, which is probably big enough to get the thing approved. And they'll refuse to tell you how much they spent on the trial, which was conducted in Bethesda on their own campus, because they know that that's something that would influence the perception of how robust the rights should be given to the person that gets the license, because if the government did most of the investment and most of the work, and also would tell you like how much you know how, how much other companies are spending on these trials to get similar therapies through. That's just it's just one of a million different examples. It's just sort of weird 
because the NIH used to be very different. They used to be very transparent about all of these things. They used to publish every year a list of their clinical trial costs uh, by phase for cancer drugs from the NCI. And they used to give you unredacted copies of the license agreements they do. They used to do public, uh, public register notices of the create agreements. They don't do any of that stuff now. And that's new, basically. So sorry about that long response, but I think it could be a change or it could be more of the same. It just depends on who, 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 gets, who gets there. Collins said something interesting though. He said he thought there should be a woman to replace him. Um, and so that would, that, 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 that would uh, change, I guess, the uh, usual suspects a bit. It certainly is a chance to visit the policy, isn't it? I mean, it's, it's a time of evaluating legacies and in consideration of a new director, I mean, this should be a criteria. This is something where where need for an about face at NIH is very clear, and, and that's that's something that we'll we can all treat as an opportunity to have the conversation as well. We'll sign on to that letter, Peter. <laughs> that's a good idea to sort of put it out there that that if they're serious about doing things. Um, uh, that that should be one of the one of the criteria they look at in someone to to, to run an agency that. It directly controls about $40 billion a year in spending and indirectly uh, also influence the spending at other federal agencies because the Operation Warp Speed spending, which was done not through the NIH, was certainly influenced by the input from the NIH uh, team. Uh, that would be good. Uh, well, I, I think we're coming to close. I don't want to run it over time. And, and uh, are there issues that people would like to, to bring up before we and I apologize for like the lack of organization in this uh, this conversation. Um, I, could, I couldn't have done a better job, I know. Um, but uh, I'd like to thank everyone that joined it because uh, you know we're, we're interested in moving things forward in here. Uh, is there any issues that people would like to uh, raise before we wind it up here? Zane, anyone that hasn't spoken? Hey, Jamie, it's, it's John Hassel at AIDS Healthcare Foundation. Um, Whoever is working on uh, a March in case, um, please let us know if you want to collaborate with us. Uh, I've got my bosses are anxious to know if this is a serious option, especially considering the pandemic we're in. So uh, I just want to put that out there to this to this to the people in this square. Thanks so much for organizing us, Jamie. That's very cool, John. Anyone else want to, uh, uh, Zane? No, you, that's clapping, right? No, no. <laughs> no I, was, I was clapping on the discussion. Um, I, I guess one thing, um, you know, I, I think we got into a little bit now, but one maybe step, next step could be a smaller group discussion based on some particular candidates. Um, I saw that you posted that link, Louise, in the chat, uh, which will be very helpful to kind of look at some of the government candidates or the government funding um, candidates. Um, and it's something, you know, it's kind of a perennial, perennial discussion, uh, but, but really thinking about what candidates might make sense in a private forum, uh, I think could be very helpful. Yeah, I think that, that, that's a good suggestion. And we're, we're going to be publishing that list uh, soon uh, for, for anyone to see uh, the candidates that, that currently have patents that declare Bible, Bible um, right. Yeah, and it's it, and it's it's necessarily kind of incomplete, but it's it's something uh, help get, helps give an idea. One thing that sort of surprises people is how few products that are that are approved every year end up with government rights in them. I mean, if you if you go through the the government role in funding R and D and breakthrough R and D is really huge, but the number of products that declare government rights in the patents is usually about one or two per year in the past. I don't know what it is now because they they're approving about twice as many products per year as they used to. So it, it could be a bigger number right now, but it used to be about 5% of the products that would be put on the market or something like that. It was a fairly small number. Uh, and, and not all of them are going to be very good candidates. That's, that's the other question. Of course, when I say that uh, two or three, and we were only looking at, at, at small molecules because the biologic drugs was just like a lot of non-transparency in the patent landscape. And it was harder to, to, to appreciate that. But uh, Amy mentioned earlier that these non-patent barriers to, to competition, like the test ad exclusivity and the orphan drug exclusivity uh, primarily, uh, they create a real problem, particularly for the biologic drugs for doing marketing requests, because it's, it's harder to argue that you can, uh, you can, you can uh, benefit. Uh, we think there might be some exceptions to that, but uh, that's also a challenge. 
Well, I, I'd like to let everybody off the hook. Thank everybody for coming. And uh, uh, we'll get back to our day jobs, okay? <laughs> Sorry we didn't hear from you, Paul. Uh, Thanks, Jamie. Thank you.